Uh, we should be ending now for the day, but I think we should uh, provide some 15 minutes uh, of questions, comments from the audience to the panelists. So make sure that uh, they're very short and concise. Um, really, really interesting presentations. I think, you, you know, thinking about the screening question, I would just appreciate um, the panelists' thoughts on how broad or narrow the screening should be, because I'm really struck by the high prevalence of violence. You know, you're talking about one in two, one in three women that you ask in Kenya um, saying yes, which could seem daunting to a health provider. And I, Jackie, I don't know the experience in America when they do the screening question, you know, are you talking 5%, 10%, 30%? So for me, the question I sort of think about in terms of screening is how broad or narrow should it be? You know, is it picking up current violence, severe violence, any violence ever? You know, and how do we make those decisions? Because to me, I, that seems like an important part of the debate about screening that hasn't been interrogated enough. Okay, next comment. Right then. Thank you very much. My name is Sharon Lamwaka. I work with survivors of SGBV. Uh, mine is a comment to Lina Digolo. Thank you very much for your presentation, but I would have very, very much loved to hear what kind of model you use for post-rape care, practically speaking. Thank you. Okay, we have another comment, two comments, three comments. Make them very short. Yeah. Thank you very much. Udongo is my name. I work for East Central and Southern Africa Health Community. My first concern will go to both Dr. Chish and Professor Jacqueline, in that uh, for us to make this screening really work, now, we are, if you are to take it to scale from where we are, do you think with the load of work the healthcare has work have, will they be able to add this into their load, do proper screening, refer, and ensure this, this glands get proper uh, redress for what, what, what they have? And my last concern is also that I'm a little deflated as somebody working with the uh, policy makers. When we seem to be you know, showing the different signals and, and, and the rather confusing signals as to whether this thing is useful or not useful. If we as the technical people here maybe are still not very sure whether it is very useful or not useful, what message are we passing to our policy makers so that Thank they you. make the correct decision? Thank you. Thank you. Next, the lady there. And, yeah, please. Uh, Thank you very much. My uh, name is um, Prudence Atquas. I work for Center for Women in Governance. Uh, my question goes to Professor Jacqueline. I was so touched by your presentation and I would like to know in your screening initiative whether you're reaching the partners of the, of the IPV survivors, taking note of the HIV discordance, which is high, and if we just screen the IPV survivors and stop there, maybe they, they, they stand high risk of getting HIV. Thank you. The gentleman over there, the lady, and then we come this way. Thank you. Couch Simon is my name. I work with African Fraternity for Justice, Peace, and Development. I thank you all who have presented. But my concern typically goes a little bit far from what we are on. We are looking at the preventing intimate partner violence. But there is no way we can discuss the social, the psychotherapy, as a solution and we leave the, the legal arm. Because at the end of the day, we are looking only at other victims, but not detailing the offenders who lead this problem to the, the scene. I think we, we must look at it in a way of maybe partnering with those other arms that can lead us to settle this thing on. Thanks so much. Thank you, the lady there, and then we come this side. My name is Dora. I work with the National Association of Women Judges Uganda. 
And mine is a general concern about, um, not concern, it's a comment mm -hmm. to the organizers. I was wondering if it's possible the next time you organize a workshop like this, if we can have uh, survivors to come and share the experiences, then when you're formulating the responses, it could also give an insight into so much, because we can be here and we're thinking all these good things, but then um, I'm imagining if we have a survivor who recounts their experiences, why do they actually still stay in those um, abusive relationships? It could help us to respond better. That's my comment. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, my name is Susan Hadley. I'm from the United States. I actually, back in the 1980s, founded the first healthcare-based domestic violence program in the United States. And when I listen to your work, Lena, I'm looking at the years that you have moved from 2005 to 2014. I would have given anything to have you available to help me back then. Um, I'm thinking of one of the first comments that I got from a doctor who was going to screen this woman in the emergency department. And he said, you know, just what was it you did that made him hit you? And right then I knew that it would be an uphill struggle. Uh, know that the woman may not acknowledge the first, first or second or fifth or eighth time you ask her, but she will always remember that you asked and where it's safe to come back when she's ready. I am totally excited about this whole afternoon because these are solutions that are, are, are in some cases in place and in some places ready to expand. I applaud every one of you, it's so great. Thank you. Thank you very much, we have two, the very last ones. The lady down, she had her hand up first and we'll end with with you, so you buy us a glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Carol Bunga Idembe from Interreligious Council of Uganda. And we have actually a GBV program intervention in one of the regions in Uganda. But uh, I really wanted the conversation around, also the discourse around the religious leaders, because I know that they wield a lot of power and uh, sometimes even using scripture, they may actually be able to heal the relationship between these two people because I've realized that we have many, many cases of people who were actually going to hurt each other. But because of this conversation having a supreme body that is beyond, they have been, somehow their hearts have changed and people have been reconciled. And I think it was Professor Jackie who said, you know, most of the cases women want actually to reconcile with their partners. They don't want to leave. But uh, I also wanted the conversation around the, in, the health institutions that are run by faith-based in, faith, uh, institutions. Because when you, when you leave them out, then you've left out about 50%. Because we also provide services we, in both health and education. And so I thought we need to have a conversation around that. Because if you leave out these institutions, then you have only had half, half of the interventions in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. The very last one. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Margaret Tucker, the Vice Chairperson of Hope After Rape. And uh, they, I really like, like to thank the presenters because what you presented is our niche in the Hope After Rape. Uh, first of all, my first question is directed to Madame Lina from Kenya. How do you deal with your justice system in Kenya? Here in our country, it's slow. The justice system is slow in handling and managing gender-based violence cases. Secondly, what mechanisms are in place that uh, enables you to follow up your survivors? Because in Hope After Rape, it wasn't easy following up the survivors, and also providing incentives to them, we realized, we actually we closed it. We had one. It became very expensive. So I would like you to share with us the mechanisms that there is in place in following them up and even providing incentives to them, because even to the children, you, you know when you have their mothers, they come, up, they come with their children. So how do you deal with the children 
when you are also catering for the mothers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was bringing the microphone to you. And, and, uh, and as I was bringing it... You don't have to come. You just make a very quick okay, comment. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, talk, I'm looking at sustainability. I'm, I'm Edwin from Interregious Council. I'm looking at sustainability. And most of, most of us could maybe identify cases where referrals have been given. People have gone, for example, to the police. And then with the drone, especially women, because they don't have any supportive mechanism. If they leave this home, where will they go? So they at times withdraw cases and give up. So maybe we need to think about how to sustain them. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and thank you for bringing the mic to me. Uh, we will start with Lena and work this way. So if Lena can go in two minutes, you don't I, mem we need to remind uh, participants that tomorrow afternoon there will be a whole afternoon session on going back to these issues and then chatting a way forward. And we would like to invite all of you to come with your experiences that can enrich the way forward uh, so that the questions you have asked are going to be turned around to you. Uh, so, Lena? Thank you. Um, thank you for the comments that were very useful. Um, I think I got three questions that can be brought, but I'll just make summarize and we can discuss them in length outside the meeting. Um, the first question was what models of uh, what models do we use for post trip care? Um, I'd say in summary that we use we with, within LVCT and I think in the country we have two models that we've decided to use in terms of scale up. One is integration, which we integrate our post-trip care services um, in our outpatient department in most, and this is public health facilities. And um, the second is the one-stop shops, um, and that's um, where we have the standalone services within the facilities or outside the facilities in both public and private sectors. Now, um, the, the, the one that we feel and, and probably still studies are needed around this, that's currently working for us as LVCT in terms of rapid scale-up scale is the integrated model, just because we have uh, you know, in, in the, uh, we, have, um, we have to work within the resources that are available, um, limited HR resources, and even limited space within the facilities. So that's the one that's currently working. We have about five GBVRC centers in the country, and those are limited to high volume and high prevalence areas. Um, um, the next comment was on the justice system and how do we work with them. I think the problem has not been really within, each, each sector has had their challenges and have had areas that they could improve from health to police to education to justice. And one of the key things as a country that has happened is we are now beginning to talk to each other because most of the issues that were there were because um, there was a lot of blame game, but also because we don't know what the justice system in health, and I'm speaking as a healthcare provider now, we were not clear on what's required, what's admissible in court, and what makes a case for the survivor. But even from the justice system, they did not know what to do when, in terms of in strengthening their system to also support the survivors. So some of the, um, some of the things that I, I actually put up there, maybe too fast, was uh, just to show that our talks are really um, gaining. <laughs> we have gains within our talks. Uh, we now ha have moved from each sector having standard operating procedures, and we now have a common standard pro operating procedures that really shows th how the survivor will be given quality services across the sectors. We are working again as a team to develop cross-sectoral referral um, tools and a referral mechanism, but also within the county system for us, I think here we is districts. Uh, at the county level, we have the same um, cross-sectoral teams that are talking to each other down to the facility level where we have service providers from health, from police, from justice, 
come in talking and make sure and ensuring that the services provided at each level are of quality. Quickly to follow up, follow up is a challenge even in Kenya and we have a high attrition rate of our survivors but one key thing that came out within our program is we don't even know how many people even complete let me say the basic uh, emergency care like even completion of PEP. The reason we don't know is because our data tools could not collect that and we found that our data tool which was the PRC register and the PRC form was only informing what was received on the first day when the survivor arrived. So immediate intervention was to then um, um, develop uh, or, or probably strengthen the tool and now the tool that's been rolled out this month will be collecting up to the 28th day. No, actually up to the final session of the trauma counseling which is um, three months of um, the longitudinal follow-up. And once we have this tool in place and we train our service providers, then we hope to be able to even tell who comes to the end. We were not able to report that. But that said, we have other interventions that we, we, we hope will um, strengthen the, the, um, the retention rate of the survivors. We have support groups that are within the facilities. In the past, we funded this, but now the facilities are taking this up and, and been, uh, providing, um, the, actually taking it up so that it's not donor funded, that the support groups are working. And just because some of these um, survivors do not have the money to come, when they come from the same region, then the support groups are run within their close to somewhere, not within their home, but somewhere that's really closer for them to be able to access. Lena, and I will have to pass on the mic very okay. quickly. Sorry. So you, for if I've not answered your question, feel free to see me after. Tatias? Uh, well, um, I do not have a direct question, but what I can comment generally is that uh, uh, in the pathways that I presented about, uh, there is one thing that I wanted to add, that uh, there are costs, both formal and informal. And in most cases, these costs are not well communicated to, um, to those who are actually making interventions. And these costs are met by the uh, IPB survivors, and sometimes it becomes a big barrier uh, to fulfilling the rest of the stages that we want, that we want the IPB survivors to pass through. Jackie? Um, I can comment on a couple. I see that Charlotte's gone, but I do think her question was important. And, you know, it's the old, it depends if you ask on, about current abuse versus um, lifetime. Um, it is, if you ask about lifetime abuse, that does increase your prevalence amazingly. It increases the number of women who will say yes. But in certain healthcare settings, like um, where we see people for chronic health conditions, like chronic pain, those kinds of things are tremendously affected by IPV, not treated adequately if you don't know about the history of IPV. So there we think we need to ask um, whether or not it's lifetime. In an emergency department, we ask about current abuse. Um, and you know you just have to decide what you want to do. And, and I know that um, the, the um, burden on the healthcare system, it's like we already have enough to do. Um, Nurses and physicians say that all the time in the United States as well as here. We know that there's a lot of work shifting that's going, or task shifting that's going to nurses um, around the world. Um, but when we ask nurses, at least in the United States, they say, yes, we've got too much to do. We've got, we're given more work all the time. But this is part of our role. We think this is important that we would do this, this um, inquiry. So before we decide that the healthcare system is overburdened, let's ask those in the healthcare system if they see this as, as part of their role. And then finally, the, the direct question in terms of partners of survivors. Yes, absolutely. If we're not addressing the partners as well as, as the survivors of violence or those experiencing violence as a victim, we're going to have increased HIV. We're going to continue to do that. And, and um, there are many strategies, uh, Suzanne Maman's work in Tanzania in terms of, of addressing um, um, men in the um, testing and counseling settings. 
um, is very and a very important model in terms of how we talk to men um, who are more likely to be perpetrators of this issue. Um, we also have to, though, be careful we don't do couple testing and counseling or the counseling part until we determine whether or not there's violence um, between the, those couples. So there's several caveats with that, but yes, it, definitely. And there's um, several questions that have been developed in the United States in terms of asking men, not only are they victims of independent partner violence, but are they perpetrators? And obviously that has to be done uh, subtly and well, but we're getting good um, where that's being tested. We're getting good um, responses on that from men that are perpetrators because many times they're concerned about what they're doing also. Um, can health providers uh, take on more? Um, Jackie says we should ask. I should say that in the Kenya study I mentioned, we did ask. And um, what they said was, yes, we are overburdened, but we realize that by screening, we are getting, we're targeting the diagnosis better. So we might as well deal with it at the root rather than have the patient run all around and then still have to have her come back and have to attend to her again. So they saw it as something that was worthwhile. I think it also emphasizes the importance of good training because when the training is done really well, what you find is that the providers really see their role in this woman's life. And someone mentioned bringing survivors in. This is something we incorporated into the training process so that the provider understood this is not just a number, this is a human being, and this is what she went through in the health system, and I could have helped. So I think that with good training, um, providers are just you know more invested, and they see this as more than just a job. So we would have providers walk clients down from the ANC, for instance, to the GBVRC, not because they had to, because we had a client escort who was hired to do that, but because they wanted to. So those are some of the changes that you, you see when the training is good. Um, what about the legal angle? We just didn't have enough time, but um, the Gender-Based Violence uh, Recovery Center that I mentioned in my presentation actually provides um, sort of comprehensive services. So there is a legal angle where any client that gets there who is interested in taking the legal route is um, linked to um, a lawyer or, or an NGO that provides legal services and then that NGO takes it from there. Uh, the comment about religious leaders, I think, is extremely important. Um, I think it's, it I means that they're definitely stakeholders, um, particularly in this region, and I don't think that we engage them enough, um, even though you know we have models that have worked um, on other issues which, which could easily be ad adapted for um, the purposes of religious leaders. SASA has an, a very interesting report that I really love, which involves um, Engaging religious leaders or something like that, a really nice, simple, and yet it's a touching publication and I think an important one. Um, so they've tried to deal with this issue. How do we deal with children? I just wanted to mention that uh, one of the things we noticed is when women did uh, were referred to the GBVRC, came and received services, they appreciated the services so much that we had several of them saying, I need to come back and this time I'll come with my children. Because after talking with the counselor, I realized that, you know, I'm not the only one that needs to talk. I think my daughter needs to talk to you too, you know. So, and uh, Dr. Dongo, lastly, I'll just say, I um, uh, didn't mean to cause any confusion. It's just to let us know there is this debate that's going on. Um, part of this debate is really based on studies based in developing countries, um, studies with particular uh, study designs, which. Um, you know, some of us uh, feel are conclusive and some of us, you know, feel that they are not. But I would say from the evidence that is coming out from this region, it does seem that um, these interventions are definitely acceptable and feasible. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, the panelists. Thank you very much for the, uh, from the audience. Um, in the folder, you find that the planning committee has provided references that can make good reading. So I would like you, I'm not giving you bedtime reading homework, but these are some of the things, and, and, and as I said before, we encourage that you add to this rich uh, list of references. I know that we have members here who have programs that may have very short video clips, maybe five minutes or so. If we can have those ones as well, and we find some time 
tomorrow either during the breaks and you know just run this three minute five minute um, video clips of what is being done uh, in this area it will be hugely helpful I think we end on the note uh, and picking my co-chair's comments that the starting point is not to disengage the starting point is not to exit a lot of these women do take and men uh, take these relationships very seriously and so the issue is not to look at um, interventions that are destroying the the relationship but um, as uh, uh, and, and one of the things I sit on one of the uh, school um, board and uh, the conversation we're having then and discussing with the administrators was that their charge should be to make sure that no young man is, is uh, expelled because of discipline, but to make sure that indiscipline does not occur so that we keep all the young people in school. So it's the same thing that we're looking at here to see how we can contribute uh, to, the, uh, to making sure that the environment within which all of us live have less of uh, intimate partner violence. Um, presented. Thank you very much for, for, for today. It's been quite a long one, but I think very uh, productive. Uh, for the local participants, if you can please pass by the reception. I think you have a message um, that I think the summary of the message is that to make sure that you come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, and for all of us, let's have a, a nice evening and we start Let's be seated by 8.30 tomorrow so that we can, you know, make a good head start. Thank you and have a good evening.